Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Charlie. Very grateful recovered alcoholic. Woo! What a good time we are having here this weekend. Everybody having fun? My home group is the primary purpose group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Austin, Texas. I think it's the greatest meeting in the world. If you're in Austin on a Tuesday night, we'd love to show you the same kind of hospitality you've been showing us here. It's a, it's a big book study group. Uh, we study the big book line by line, week after week, and uh, it's a lot more fun than it sounds like. Um, there's a... <laughs> There was a time in my sobriety, many times in my sobriety, where I would have been like, oh boy, uh, the big book. And, uh, what, and what about next week? Oh, more big book. Oh, <laughs> good. You know, I, and, but uh, um, we, we, uh, we meet on Tuesday nights, and we've been running about 250 people on a Tuesday night studying the big book. And it just it tells me... I think Alcoholics Anonymous is making a big comeback in AA, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I think uh, I think uh, you know real alcoholics are hungry for real solution, and we find it in this book. I, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a big book uh, thumper. I'm an unapologetic big book guy. I uh, I love what my buddy Bill C. out in California says. He says, "When did working the steps and out of the big book become right wing?" You know, I. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but but uh, we're gonna we're gonna. I can't wait to hear what I'm gonna talk about. I uh, <laughs> we'll get around to it. But oh my God, you know, I mean, I've been places where they set the bar high before. But come on, you know, I mean, I'm sitting there. Even my my wife, you got you got to hear my diminutive bride do four and five this morning. My little shrinking violet, uh, Katie is. Katie's my best friend in AA. She's my wife. She's my partner, and uh, and she's the the best AA I've ever known. She uh, um, she I hope to talk. Katie, my talk and Katie's talk have a lot in common. We both talk a lot about Katie. You know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we were sitting here and. I'm, you know, I'm watching, and you know, and I'm, I'm watching Peter last night. I mean, just just going through the speakers. You know, uh, we had Carl last night. We love Carl, I, and you know, and Carl Step One is is fantastic. And I listen to Carl, and it's amazing how many of the same things we say. And and I listen to him, and I'm going, did I steal that from him, or did he steal that from me? You know, and and we've kind of figured out that we're just we're on parallel universes. You know, I mean, because it's amazing with the, with the a lot. He does like this, I do like this. You know. But um, a lot of the same stuff and a lot of step one, you know. And and then uh, we love Mike Lorenz. Uh, you know, he is actually literally one of our best friends and one of my – he's in – as far as pace horses or running buddies in AA, you know, we I go to Mike with 10 steps probably as much as I go to my own sponsor, you know, uh, and, and I know what I'm going to get there. And uh, – and I, but I don't always anticipate it. Sometimes he hits me with a sucker punch out of nowhere, and we may talk about that a little bit tonight, you know. And, and then Peter, when Peter was up here, I'm going, why am I talking about actualizing the power when we got Peter here? I mean, he was up there, and I was going, why didn't I do step three? And we have Peter talk about actualizing the power because that was all his talk was about last night. It, and I love an unapologetic talk that talks about God. You know, we're going to talk about God a little bit tonight. You know, and uh, um, I'll get back to that. I should warn you, I got some pretty serious ADD working up here, and I, 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 I go off on bunny trails. I have to bring some little bullet points with me, or I'm liable to talk about first grade for 45 minutes, you know. <laughs> I was giving a talk one time, and I called this buddy of mine, and I said, he was giving a talk at the same time in Dallas, and I was talking to Austin, and he, he calls me the next morning, he goes, how'd it go? I said, oh, God almighty, Tom. I said, you know, 40 minutes into my talk, I was uh, I was still drinking, and he goes, oh, that's okay. He goes, two-thirds of the way through my talk, I was 11. You know, I mean, <laughs> so, so it's like, sometimes I have to focus a little bit, but there will be times when I'll say we're going to get back to that later. 
And what that means is this is not the appropriate time to introduce that piece of information into the talk. But when I say we're going to get back to it, we're probably not coming back. You know, I mean, I always, I always get real excited when I actually circle back around to one. You know, I was like, hey, Katie, did you see that? I just pulled one back up. But, but then, you know, and then, uh, and then, uh, Kate, of course, Katie doing four and five, and I thought Bob just nailed six and seven. That was spectacular. I've been, I've been admiring Bob for 25 years. We did work together 25 years ago when I was uh, going through my first divorce. Um, not my last divorce, but my first one. And and uh, and Bob was a lot of help to me, and I'll never forget that. He was about 20. He must have been in his 20s. I would have been about four and a half years sober, and it was a uh, it was it was a significant event to me, you know, and, and that a guy like that was taking my calls. And then of course, Gary Brown is at the at the head of my lineage, and and uh, um, we'll talk about that some too. We had the pleasure of having Gary and Julie down to the house here a few weeks ago, and it's just it's just a real treat. But I mean, and and then Steve. I was, I was rooting for Steve. I love Steve. I admire Steve. I, you know, I, I'll never forget it till the first time I met him. And we got a common friend in Danny. You know, we, uh, we both love Danny. I mean, this guy is beautiful. And for some reason, Steve's at Brownwood one time, this Lakeside Conference, and I, I'm finally going to get to meet Steve Lee. And I walk up to him, and I, and I swear to God, it was like I went, hey, <laughs> how you doing? You know, and, and I walk away, and I go, what the hell was that? You know, I just, I just, Cratered in front of Steve, you know, and but he makes me a little nervous, you know, and, and, and a lot of it, a lot of it is the clarity and the definition, and he just reminds me of a man that I like to be like, you know, in AA, and and I'm sitting there and uh, and he's talking and he's just crushing all the topics that I'm going to talk about, and you know, and, and and I leaned over to Katie, and now Katie's my biggest supporter, and I lean over to her and I go, honey, I got to follow this, and she goes. Yeah, but there's a long break. You know, I mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank God for my support group. But, but you know, I, wa I want to take a second to thank anybody that had anything to do with this thing coming together. I have been involved in things like this. And if you've been involved in stuff like this, you know there's a lot of people that did a lot of hard work to get this thing to come together. And uh, and if it's like the AA where I come from, there's also a lot of people that didn't do a darn thing, but they have an opinion about how it could have been done just a little bit better, you know. And uh, and and I, I know that's the fellowship I crave. That's my people, you know. And uh, but I w I really want to thank you know Mark and Dawn and everybody that had it because you know it just blows my. I've got some history in New York City. One of my marriages was centered around New York City, and and uh, and and Katie loves to hear about it, you know. I, uh, Oh my God, we used to go to movies, you know, and I'd be like, that's Columbus Circle right there, honey, you know, and that's, you know, and she's like, look in here, you see anybody who gives a flip, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, uh <laughs> but I, I commuted in a marriage from Austin to New York City for 12 years, and, and, and I hope to talk about some of that, you know, tonight, because we, we had, a, you know, it was, a, it was a very interesting situation. But the idea that, that New York City doesn't have a big conference just blows my mind, you know. I mean, it seems like there'd be a squillion people at a thing like this. I don't, I, you know, and I'm hoping that it builds support, and once word gets out about what a good time we're having, that, uh, that, you know, it'll be, they'll have to take this wall down next time we're in here, you know, and I've seen that happen in other conferences. But oh my God, it's so expensive to do something in New York City. I mean, did you know, I mean, I've spent a few dollars in my life, but did you know the coffee is $94 a gallon? $94 a gallon. I'm like adding water to mine, you know. I feel like I'm doing 12-step work by watering down my coffee, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and so anyway, it, it was a big risk to put this on, and, and I, for one, am grateful, you know. And, and, you know, well, I didn't pick this topic. I am filling in for my buddy Bob, who, who was not, who's not here this week, and he had picked this topic, actualizing the power. 
doesn't that sound deep and complicated? You know, I was like, and I told, I told Mark, I said, I'll take the time slot. I'll keep the topic, you know, I'll bounce around it, you know, and then everybody has just crushed the topic, you know, I went, I went to St- Steve and I go, you're killing me, you know, you're just, I mean, <laughs> all the stuff you said, you just hit my topic better than I was hoping, but I'm going to try to take the topic seriously, you know, um, and Mark has been killing me all weekend, he's like, it's attenuating the power, Charlie, it's, it's, in, it's act- actualizing, the, it's insinuating the power, it's, uh, <laughs> Is, you know, formulating the power, and I'm like, and by, by, by the time, and, but I, uh, at 7.19, I was in my room in my underwear and needed a shower, so I'm, I'm still, I hope to show up here any minute, but I, uh, uh, that was, that was record time for a boy my size getting dressed, I gotta tell you, so, so anyway, I hope you see the coat and tie, I come from a lineage of people where, in, in my sponsorship lineage, if you get behind the podium, you, you show respect for this fellowship that saved my life, and I wear a coat and tie when I get behind the podium, my sponsor told me it was okay if I didn't want to wear a coat and tie, he said, you still have to do it, but, but, <laughs> If you want to do it under protest, that'll be just fine, you know. I mean, you know, and, and, and you know, and it, most of my experience in a coat and tie before I got to you people, I had a very simple job. My job was to stand there, and when they nudged me, I'd say, "Not guilty, Your Honor." <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one with that experience, but I, uh, but. Uh, I'm going to talk out of my own experience. You know, one of the things you've heard everybody talk about is out of their own experience. And, and, you know, how do you actualize this power? Well, you know, Steve's story is going to be a little different from Mike's and Carl's and Ralph's. And, and, and the guys coming, you know, Ralph and, and Clancy. Now, Clancy is showing a lot of potential in this program. And I, and I think, I think, I think we should stand behind him. You know, I, and then, and then Chris tomorrow morning, I just love. I mean, Chris is the one that got us to do our first workshop. He told Katie, I goes, I think you guys should do a workshop. And I'll never forget it. You know, he, say, he says, you should do a workshop. And I'm like, oh, my God, what are we going to talk about Friday night, all day Saturday, and Sunday morning? I'm still a little nervous about doing a one-hour talk. And he says, and so, uh, what are you going to talk about? Well, he sends down a little perspective schedule. He goes, I was thinking you could do step one from here to here, and she could do, and then, and I look at the schedule, and I swear to God, my first thought was, I'm going to need more time. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> so we've been fighting over the microphone ever since, you know. But that was a lot of fun, and we love doing workshops, we love doing conferences. But everybody talks about, in AA, we talk about coming out of our own experience. And I have a little joke I like to tell just to kind of get warmed up a little bit. It's, and and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 some of you may have heard this joke before. Some of you might have heard me tell this joke before, but it's a good joke and I like the way I tell it. So, uh, um, I'm come, and it's about this guy that's driving along one day and he, we're talking about coming out of our own experience. This guy's talking along. He's driving along one day and he sees a sign on the post at this farmhouse and it says, talking dog for sale. He can't stand it. He goes up to the farmhouse and he, and he says, so you got a talking dog for sale? And the guy says, yeah, he's around back. And he wanders around back and there's this red hound dog laying there and he walks up to the dog and he goes, so you can talk? And the dog says, well, I certainly can. He goes, good grief, how did that happen? And he said, well, when I was young, I started picking up some language skills. And as I got older, I developed some of the nuances of the language, began to develop slang and colloquialisms. And it's really made for an amazing life for me. He said, I've traveled all over the world. I've eaten in some of the finest restaurants. I've stayed in five-star hotels all over the world. I've eaten the cooking of some of the best chefs in the world. And he said, but really, more, you know, more interesting than that, he said, some of my pups have developed foreign language skills and have become international diplomats. He says, I... I have, he says, I had a 19-year career with the D- Drug Enforcement Administration, and I was able to infiltrate some situations that no human agent would have ever gotten into. But you know, but my pups are really what I like to talk about. I have two pups that are in the United Nations right now. And uh, the guy goes, good grief. He said, it's really been fascinating talking to you. And he goes back out front where that farmer is, and he goes, how much do you want for a dog like that? And the guy goes, I don't know, 40 bucks? And he goes... Why on earth would you sell a fantastic dog like that for forty dollars? And the guy thinks for a second. He goes, "None of that crap he told you is true." You know. I 
it's kind of like that around here. It doesn't matter how good the story is if it's not my experience, you know. So, so we're going to talk about actuating the power, you know. Um, I looked up actuating in the dictionary when I was still pretty serious about doing this, and uh, it says actuating to put into motion, to start a process, to turn on, right? To turn on what? To start what? To put what into motion? The power. When we show up here, we don't have any power. The book clearly says, lack of power was my dilemma. And then what we do, though, is in step, and then why are we trying to talk about it? Because in step one, we experience the need, we, we establish the need for the power. When we get a guy in here and we go over step one, and, and then, um, and, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I love talking about step one. Our book spends the doctor's opinion in the first 43 pages of the book talking about step one. It's that important. If you don't establish that I got no shot on my own power, I don't know why I'd be interested in this other power. As long as I think my power's got a shot, how am I looking on that screen? (laughs) They say those screens add about 60 pounds, you know, so... uh, um, But... We introduce the power in step two, and then we get to the root of the problem in step three. And in steps four through nine, we remove what's blocking me from the power. And in step ten, like Steve was talking about, I watch for reemergence of the things that block me from the power. And then in eleven, we try to improve our conscious contact with the power. And then, and we go on and on. I'm going to read a couple of things out of the big book. This is just a large print copy of the big book. It's just, it's not outside literature. My sponsor owns a book bindery and he took my big book and, and, uh, leather bound it for It's one of my most prized possessions. It doesn't wait long to make promises to a guy like me. Some people heard me say I'm a recovered alcoholic. I, there was a time in my, I've been on both sides of a lot of the things we're going to talk about tonight. And there was a time when I would have thought, man, don't, you better not say that, dude. You'll be, that's like walking under a ladder, you know. I mean, you'll be drunk by sundown if you say you're recovered. What are we talking about having recovered from? It says, the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. And in the forward of the first edition, It says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. I love that. But, you know, back on, later on page 19, one of the things I'm going to get around to is it, this blew my mind when I'd been working a program based on not drinking for a long time. And you've heard some people talk about that tonight. When you're thinking that the finish line in Alcoholics Anonymous is to not drink, this line knocked me off my chair. It says, we feel that the elimination of our drinking is but a beginning. What? A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. The places where I spend the most time, my home, my job, and out in the world, you know, is, is where it says a more important demonstration of our principles. That's what we're going to talk about when we talk about actualizing the power. I love on page 20 where it says, doubtless you are curious. Where did it go? Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a seemingly, from a hopeless condition of mind and body. If you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. We shall tell you what we have done. And in the book on 25, it says, There is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of our shortcomings, which the process requires for a successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we'd come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of our life. When, therefore, based on those two things that I've seen, I've seen it work for others and I've discovered how futile my life is, the way I'm living it, when I'm convinced of those things, when I'm approached by people in whom the problem had been solved, there's nothing left for me to do but pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of, uh, of which we had not even dreamed. The great, see if they're, they're not really going easy on God on this page, you know. It says, the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we, the people who are on the other side of this deal, have, have experienced 
have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He's, he has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could not do by ourselves. And then it goes into talking about that turning point, which several people have mentioned tonight. You know, we read how it works in every meeting. And they say, we stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. You know, the we they're talking about is the founders of our program. And, I, and for a long time, I didn't ever ask myself what that turning point was. But it's there on page 25 where it says, if you were seriously hopeless, as, as alcoholic as we were, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out of my consciousness, consciousness my intolerable situation, the best I can, and the other to accept spiritual help. My sponsorship lineage believes in turning these statements into questions out of the big book. And, I, and when I read stuff like that, I ask myself, is that my situation? Am I convinced of that? Is that what I believe based on my experience? Or do I think there's a door number three for me? I mean, we know that God irritates some people. About half of our fellowship has some problems with the idea of talking about God. And you notice that the book, we don't open the book on page one and go, God gets you sober, God keeps you sober, rock on. You know, if a guy like me, you gotta pound me into a hopeless spot where I got, I got no shot. If I got it the way you're describing it, I got no shot without this power. You know? Do I believe that? Because there's no good news at the end of step one. Right? Imagine we bring Carl in here. He's brand new. He just got out of the Navy. And, uh, and we say, I love your drinking on Anna Beer's story. That's, uh, I would have drank with this guy in a minute. That's the highest compliment I can pay anybody in AA is when I go, <laughs> oh, I'd have drank with him. You know, I mean, there's some guys where I go, I wouldn't have drank with him if he had a keg in his living room, you know, but, uh, but, uh, of course I judged no man. But, uh, but, you know, um, but we get Carl in here and we go, okay, Carl, here's the deal. You got a body that doesn't respond regular to drinking. When you start drinking, it's going to get away from you and, and, and you'll never be able to control it with any success. You know, it's a big problem. Not your biggest problem, though. You've also got a mind that gets so uncomfortable when you're sober that it's going to lead you back to drinking every time, every time, every time. Really sorry. Try to have a nice day. You know? <laughs> but, but that's where I find myself at, at the end of, at the end of step one. You know, and I'm rolling through my notes pretty good here. You know, but it says, uh, by every form of experimentation and self-deception, I will try to prove myself an exception to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. I'll even try not working the steps. I think the bulk of people that come into AA these days go to the meetings and put the plug in the jug. I hate to say it, but I really think people that have worked all 12 steps out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous are in the minority in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous these days. It's been my experience. I don't like reporting it. But I think most of us, you know, and I've been on a lot of sides of a lot of this stuff. I think most of us, when we decide we got a drinking problem, we got, for most people, going back to AA means going to those meetings and not drinking. And if you got alcoholism the way I got it, those meetings will keep me sober right up till I get drunk. You know, uh, you know, because there's going to come a time when I can't recall the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. And I can't stop on self-knowledge. I love Fred, we study the big book a little bit. There are stories in there that just, just, you know, I used to read some of this stuff and get nothing out of it. I have fallen in love with Fred, you know. I mean, this guy, you know, you know, Fred's the one where it talks about that he was the accountant and he had the family. And I, I like to say I was a lot like Fred, except for the family and the career and the likable personality and, and you know, and every, but other than that, I was a lot like Fred. And, and, uh, but you know, Fred, he, he, uh, he comes in, he says they laid out the spiritual answer in the program of action, and, and he, he says, I, I agree with what you say, and I can identify with a lot of it, and thanks for the information, I'll take it from here. And he goes out in the world, and next thing you know, he says, we heard no more of Fred for a while. I'd like to hear more about that period. But, uh, 
But then he's back in the hospital, and they come back to see him, and it says they laid on me heaps of evidence that, that an alcoholic personality like mine, you know, was was going to drink again. And, and it says, and, and it says they, they cited stories out of their own existence. Why would they do that? It says this process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. That's why we tell these guys our stories. That's why we go into, you know, and identify with, you know. And then, but when I fell in love with Fred, was then it, he says, the program of action, though entirely reasonable, seemed a little bit drastic. You know? That's my man right there. You know, it's like, yeah, I'll admit I'm dying and I got no shot and, you know, and, you know, and, and I understand it's working for you guys, but really? Eight? Four? That seems a little drastic. You know, can't we just, can't we just go to the meetings, you know, and put the plug in the jug and that sort of thing? So, you know, when we talk about the spiritual answer to our program, there's a thing in there where it talks about this doctor. It was, it was Percy Pollock was the doctor's name at Bellevue Hospital. And, I, you know, when you read the book real fast, you know, a lot of this stuff will just go right over my head. But when I really am looking at this line by line and looking at what this guy says, he says, he was a staff member at a, at a, a well-known hospital, and he says that the, he believes that everybody was hopeless apart from divine help. And he says, there's the part I love. He says, though not a religious person, I have profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. For most cases, there is no other solution. So here's this doctor saying, look, I, I don't really believe in God, you know, but you might want to look at it, you know. <laughs> Just saying, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's like, because we got nothing else for you, you know. I mean, <laughs> there's only two powers that have ever worked in my life. It's a whole lot of vodka or a whole lot of God. God dang it. I should warn you, I'm a shotgun shooter. I'm a big guy. I ride Harleys. I do all this stuff. <laughs> I'm liable to cry like a little girl in a pink dress up here. I mean, I mean, you know, and, and I swear to God... Even during Steve's talk, I was going, he even cries more manly than I do. You know, I mean, for God's sake. So he can cry and keep talking, you know. And But, you know, Peter knows what I'm talking about. There's a guy I'm going to talk to some about tonight named Mark H. And he came into my life, and every once in a while, I think I'm going to be able to get out one of his trademark lines. And I get about halfway through it, and it just goes up in me. So uh, forgive me, but... The thing, we, the reason we talk so much about God, you know, is in this power is, you know, it says you may, like Peter said last time, you, if, if, if those two things on page 44 that I can't control when I start drinking and I can't stay stopped when I really want to stop, it says if that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. In my book, I've underlined it twice, and it says only with a question mark. I hear people talking about maybe we should reduce the talk of God in Alcoholics Anonymous. That we could get more, we would attract more members if we didn't lay on the God piece so much. It's the only product we have to offer. We got identification and power. That's the only two things we have. We can identify with the guy. You know, I was going to say, if you want to attract more members, I'll tell you the piece that's running new guys off is the not drinking part. You know? <laughs> Maybe we should lighten up on that one a little bit, you know. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, I'm just like, you know, I mean, we know that not everybody's just digging the idea of, of God in this deal, but it's the only. Th I mean, we, you know, do I believe that my two choices are live life on a spiritual basis or die an alcoholic death? Do I think I got some kind of a door number three? Because that's the way I operate. When I get out of a treatment center, I don't act like a guy that thinks he's powerless over alcohol. I act like somebody who's almost powerless over alcohol. And when I'm almost powerless, I don't have to do all the stuff you're talking about. Right? I don't have to, I don't have to go to any lengths. I don't have to do this inventory. And Mark, Mark used to tie everything to step one. You know, when you get around to, do you want to write inventory, Charlie? And you're like, no, not, not particularly, no. I'm, you know. And he goes, well, what if your choices are 
write inventory, or drink vodka. I'm like, well, good grief. I mean, compared to what happens to me when I drink vodka, right in the inventory is a walk in the park. That's what we, that's what drives me through a lot of this stuff. I want to talk a little bit about my story in AA because I've had two very distinct experiences in AA. Katie and I were, came in at essentially the same time. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> she has a, uh, and, uh, and she's watched a lot of this story take place. She's been she's been around for all my marriages, and and uh, and and you know. But we were literally like brother and sister for 20 years. We were in the same home group. We were what we call litter mates. We came in at the same time, and and, and but. I came to the meetings. I hit bottom with drinking. I'm a bad drunk. I started. I didn't start drinking until I was 16, and I probably didn't need you people until I was like 17. You know, I mean, so, so I had a pretty good year of controlled drinking. You know, uh, but I'm telling you, it got it got ugly early, and, and I mean, by 17, I had a I had a serious problem, and, and I was. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in singleness of purpose. I, I, Alcoholics Anonymous is about alcoholics working with alcoholics. So we don't try to be all things to all people. And, when I, and I have deep respect for this program. But my alcoholism led me to do things other than drink alcohol. I did things to treat my spiritual malady uh, that uh, outside of alcohol. But I don't talk about it from the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I, I just, just say I have deep experience with with a lot of things. That, and, you know, but... It had really gotten away from me fast. And I came to the meetings, I came to AA, and I just felt, you know, uh, uh, Bob talked about it. I fell in love with AA when I came in. I loved it from the very beginning. I loved the fellowship. But I'm sitting in those meetings with the chatter of a thousand monkeys inside my head. You know, you, you remember, I mean, just the mind of a newcomer is, uh, is a fascinating thing. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, I just, and, and, and I came in and I, I got a sponsor, but you know, I was really basic. I, we went through the steps. I had a sponsor that had five years. I will love this man till the day he dies. I don't ever want to stand up here and act like Jim did anything wrong and sponsor me. I am a firm believer that if a sponsor and a sponsee are both giving it their best shot, God takes up a lot of slack in that equation. You know, and, 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 and now he wasn't a technician as much as, you know, but, but he showed me a lot of things. He showed me character and dignity and respect and, and how to do what you said you were going to do. And there were times where he'd made me do things just because I said I was going to do it. Completely foreign concept for me. You know, I would make, I'm quick to commit and quick to bail. And he would say, if you told somebody you're going to be there, then you're going to go, you know, but I got a better offer. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter. You told him you're going to go. And you're like, what? You know, and he taught me, you know, we're going to these conferences, and he taught me about all kinds of stuff. I mean, he taught me about, you know, when you go to the conferences, you get in the line, and you thank the speaker. And, and you know, it's funny. We're going to talk about selfishness and self-centeredness a lot. That's my favorite thing, and I, it, just, it killed me that Steve was pounding it so much because that was going to be my whole trick tonight. But uh, I talk a lot about selfishness and self-centeredness out in the world. And I'm giving a talk out in Oxnard, California one time. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I'll never get back to it, so I'm just going to tell it right now. There's a long line of people in the thank the speaker line. I love the Louis Clancy because it's the thank the speaker line. It's not the do your fifth step with the speaker line. It's not the <laughs> tell them, you know, it's thank the speaker. You know, it's also not the time when you need to come up and tell me what you didn't agree with. You know, oh my God, that, that guy goes home with me. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I had a guy come up and one and he goes, loved your talk. I agreed with almost everything you said. And in a burst of spirituality, I was able to say, Thank you. And not have to go, what was it you did not, you know, what, what did you not agree with? You know, I, but, but I'm in, I'm in Oxford, California, and there's this big long line of people, and they're pretty good about getting in line and thanking the speaker, and, uh, and we're, we're doing this whole line, and I've just done a big chunk of my talk on selfishness and self-centeredness, and I look over, and there's a guy standing around here, and he goes, hey man, uh, I don't like standing in lines, I just, I just wanted to say thanks, for, you know, for coming, and I go, <laughs> Did you happen to hear the piece about selfishness and self-centeredness? You know, we were talking about. Do you really think all these people in line are the people that just dig standing in lines? You know, I mean, they just. You know, I have sponsors that go, "I'm not going." You know, I, I don't dig funerals. I don't. I don't like going to funerals. I go, really. Really? Are you that self-centered? I mean, you really think all those people that are getting dressed up and going to that funeral are people that just can't wait for their next funeral? You know, it's like, oh, I love a funeral. You know, it's like, could you be a little more self-centered? You know, I mean, 
But anyway, I, mean, I wasn't hearing all this for a long time. And, and I, I loved the fellowship, and I went through the steps, and, 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 but I still had, I didn't have the selfishness and self-centeredness piece. I went, and what we did was we went through the steps. I did an inventory. Like Bob said, my first inventory was pretty much a confession, right? You know, I talked about the major things that I had done that bothered me. I talked about things that were in, in all the dark stuff in my past, and I felt a lot better as we talked about it. And at the end, we had no fourth column. And I'm, I don't like to get hung up on the fourth column, but there's a major piece of work on page 67 that was missing in my first inventory. Whether you call it third column, fourth column, fifth column, tenth column, expanded third column, I missed this big piece of work, and we'll talk a little bit about that maybe. <laughs> but, but then six and seven, you just kind of phone those in, you know. I mean, I, I, you know, I'd done my little confession thing, and I said, "Go home and think about what you did." And six and seven felt like I was saying, "God, make me a better dude," you know. And and, uh, and and then I went out to make amends. Now we did do a pretty good job of making quite a few amends, you know, and some pretty serious ones. Most of the ones that bothered me, and, and most of the ones, you know, when we talk about that tornado roaring its way through people's lives, I kind of went to the people that were first touched by that tornado. You know, my family and my mom and my dad and that sort of thing. Well, and then, uh, tenth step, every once in a while if I really did something awful, I would apologize for it. And then eleventh step, I kind of kept a, a daily reader on the back of the toilet and about one day out of ten I would read it and it's okay, God, see you tomorrow. And, and off we go. And, and you know, but I'm rolling along, and I'm very much about staying sober. And you know this guy. When the whole deal is about staying sober, I'm that guy in the meetings, you know, that's going, well, screamed at my wife this morning and burned out of the driveway, slapped one of the kids, got in the car and burned out of the driveway, got to work an hour late, looked at two hours of Internet porn when I was at work and gambled a little bit online, and then I left work an hour and a half early and got a gallon of Bluebell ice cream and ate it in the car. But I didn't drink today, and by God, that makes me a winner. You know, and, and you're, you're like, no, uh, that kind of makes you a Nimrod, pal. You know, uh, you know, but, but, but that's kind of the A program I was working in. I mean, I was barely hanging on, and when I when I went to Bob, I will never forget it because it seemed like I've always been a conference guy. I've always been a, a go to conferences. I like the gathering up. I like the people that are fired up about being an Alcoholics Anonymous because. Clearly, my life was saved and changed by the fellowship and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never had any doubt about that. I was a dying man when I got to you people, and I was a burden to anyone that, that happened to be unfortunate enough to know me. I was a big fan of pawn shops. I don't know about any, any other pawn shoppers here tonight. Come on. Okay, all right. I mean, I loved everything about the pawn shops. I could go, I could go, there was a purity about it. You know, you go, you go in the pawn shop, and, and, and they never say, like, Good God, man, what are you going to do with this money, you know, or, uh, or <laughs> weren't you just here this morning, you know, or you know, anything like that? You just give them the shotgun and you leave. And, you know, and, 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 you know, us drunks, we make some good plans. We make plans that you could take over to NYU and they'd look it over and they'd go, Pretty solid plan, you know. I mean, you know, and, and and my plan was I had 90 days to get everything out of the pawn shops, and and I would I would go get everything out of the pawn shops, and, and except for one time a blackout drinker, and one time I pulled a little scam that was enough to get everything out of the pawn shops, and I, I stopped by to settle my tab at the bar that I drank in, and I came out of a five day blackout. I blacked out often, but I didn't have many of those. This was five days, don't remember anything. And I come out of the blackout on the side of the bed at my parents' house, and, and I had eight dollars in this pocket, and I still had all those pawn tickets in this other pocket. And you know those mornings. That's the morning where I'm sitting there on the edge of the bed at my mother's house. I should tell you that I was so poorly treated as a child that I ran away from home at the age of 28. I, uh, I'm serious. Never went back. You know? But I come, out of the, I come out of this blackout on the side of the bed at my mother's house, and I got $8 in this pocket, and I got all those pawn tickets, and I'm just like, oh, no. Oh, no. 
because I shot my wad on this other little scam, and now I got nothing. And my dad was a good man. My dad worked hard for his stuff. Nobody was giving him his stuff, and I'm out there pawning it, and I know that ain't right. I'm not a sociopath. I, somebody else talked about it. I can't do that stuff and not have it bother me. And I'm not going to let my dad's shotgun go for $40. So I would have to go to my father and say, Dad, listen, um, if we act now, I can get you a pretty good deal on all your stuff, you know, but, but if we wait till tomorrow, it's strictly retail, you know, and, I mean, and if, are there any al in the room tonight? How many al do we have here? Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I, I love al -Anon. I love the program of al -Anon. I especially love it for al -Anons. I don't want to get off on a big soapbox, but I don't know that the al need a bunch of alcoholics coming in there trying to figure out how to manage their lives better. But I said I wasn't going to get off on that, but uh, I love al -Anon. For God's sakes, they're the only group of people that loves us. You know, and, and I mean, and for the Alanons in the room, and because when I came in in the mid '80s, my sobriety date—I don't know if I told you—is March 22nd of 1985. And uh, when I came in, it was real clever to to tell jokes about Alanons in in the rooms, and I, it never did strike me as funny. I mean, they, they, most of us would be dead if it wasn't for one or more Alanons in our life. And I just, I want to, I want, I, I don't ever want to take that for granted. But if you're Alanon, believe me, we know that's not funny. When I talk about if we act now, I remember the desperation of that day. I remember having, you know, to go to him and say that because what would happen was we would get in the car and we would drive around Dallas and it wasn't just going to the pawn shop. Dallas is a big spread out town. Like I live in Austin now, but this was in Dallas and it's like Los Angeles. It's spread out. You know, we got to go to Garland Road and get your shotgun. We go out to Beltline Road and get the deer rifle and your metal detectors are in Oak Cliff and up on East Grand is the coin collection and the sterling silver is in Garland and it was all day in the car with me and my dad and all that shame. And when we'd be driving around, I'd be saying, Dad, I swear to God, I will never do this again. And if I was lying to that man, I damn sure didn't know it because it felt like I meant it with every fiber of my being. I will never do this again. What I didn't know riding in the truck with that man was that I didn't have the power to make good on that promise. When I was promising him that I would never do this again, I might as well have promised him that I'm going to flap my arms and fly around this room because I did not have the power to make good on that promise. That's the guy that showed up here for Alcoholics Anonymous. That's how cool I was. That's how slick I was. I was a burden to everyone that was unfortunate enough to care about me or be associated with me. That's how slick I was. Well... So that, I worked that program for a while. I go through the steps, but I'm hitting walls. I hit, I blew up a marriage at four and a half years, and that's when I got with Bob. Bob was the first one. I went to the Lone Star Roundup. There were 3,000 people there, and I'll never forget it. I can still tell you the temperature of the room, where I was sitting, where Bob was, this ridiculous sport coat he had on. And, uh, and, and, uh, I mean, they were wild back then. Those were, those were awesome sport coats. I wish I knew where to get one now, but, uh, he was the first guy I'd ever heard talk about having significant problems in sobriety. It seemed like up to that point that everybody I heard talking from these podiums was talking about my life was a wreck, and then I came through those doors, and it's been nothing but caring and sharing ever since. And I'm sitting there at four and a half years sober, and I don't know what's wrong with me because I ain't doing okay. When I stop drinking, untreated alcoholism will kill me. You know, and I'm... I'm about half a badass. I can hang in there for a long time, but I am miserable, and the booby prize is everybody that's associated with me gets to be miserable too. I'm a little bit restless. I get a little irritable. Huh? I never really thought I was irritable. I had this sponsor call me the other day. This is a great story. This sponsor called me the other day, and he says, oh, I came home today. I was a little irritated with my wife, you know, and I was, I was, well, I was still kind of irritated with this guy from work, you know, and then I got a little irritated with, my, with one of the guys at the meeting, and I said, you know, it's funny. I said, uh, I hear you talking a lot about being irritated. He goes, yeah. I go, you probably wouldn't like being described as irritable, though. He goes, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I see, because when I'm irritated, it's y'all. When I'm irritable, it's me, you know? Katie said, if I'm going to be free, the problem's got to be me. 
Well, I, I get in this marriage up here, and, and things are good. From the outside, everything looked good. I married a, a woman with a seven-figure salary in a penthouse apartment in New York City, and we had a beach house in the Hamptons, and from the outside, everything looked good. It was the phoniest, most dishonest relationship I've ever been in, but my mother loved it because all the merit badges were there. And i, I got to say, in all fairness, the, the phoniest and most dishonest thing about that marriage was me. She wasn't doing anything different, she, you know. And, and, but I just come off of being knocked to the mat, back to back, two different marriages. Every time I step in the ring, I get knocked to the mat, and I thought, forget it, I'm going to try it this way, and it didn't work out. And it was, and Katie's watching this whole time. Katie didn't approve of any of my marriages. I mean, she didn't. She certainly didn't like the 19-year-old, and uh, and. <laughs> and, and, uh, and she's watching this one. But anyway, one night. We charter a plane, and we're going to fly from East Hampton out, out on Eastern Long Island. We're going to, we had a beach house out there, and we're going to fly from the Hamptons back into Manhattan. I'll never forget it. In the New York Post, they said Mr. Parker and his wife had chartered a plane to fly from their Hamptons home to go in and have dinner at Cipriani's. Don't you know there were people reading the post going, I wish he'd have died. You know, I mean, <laughs> really, you chartered a plane to come from your house in the Hamptons to go to Cipriani's for dinner, you poor thing. You know, and, but, uh, but we're going along and now I knew couples that flew to the Hamptons every weekend for 20 years. It was the first time I ever chartered a plane in my life and we're going along. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, I'm in the co-pilot seat. It was a six-seater Cessna 210. Everybody always asks me, I have retractable landing gear. I'm in the co-pilot seat. I am not a co-pilot. But uh, I'm sitting in the co-pilot seat, and, and the thing you don't want to hear your charter pilot say when you put on the little headphones is for him to be going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, and, I'm, and, and then I hear them say, you're cleared to Gabreski Airport. And I look, and there's a runway right out there at 10 o'clock, and we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. And he says, you don't understand. I've lost engine power. I can't make land. I'm going to have to ditch. We're out over the Peconic Bay. And, and uh, I'm looking at him like, what? <laughs> you know, and, and he says, he says, brace for impact. <laughs> Anybody know how to do that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so... Boosh, we hit the water, and it's like splashed down at Six Flags times a thousand. I mean, there's spray and water and glass and and uh, and then absolute silence. And all of a sudden, I'm like, holy mackerel, I think we're okay. And right about that time, I felt something on my knee. This wasn't much of an airplane. Really crappy boat. You know, I mean, about the time I realized I think we're okay, that water goes... And uh, I go up to get air, and there's nothing but water on the roof of the plane. And that's what I remember thinking. So that's it. I die in this airplane tonight. This is it. This is the day I die. And I go back underwater, and the door comes open, and I get out, and we wind up being on Anderson Cooper, and and uh, you know all the hum- there were five adults and one dog, and the only non-survivor was the dog. And uh, it was, it, but we didn't survive by much. We came much closer to drowning than dying from the plane crash. The reason I t- it's funny because Katie and I just did a workshop in Hampton Bays the other day, and uh, and during the break on Saturday afternoon, I had read the I found the old newspaper story about the plane crash, and we went over to the guy's house, and we got to go in and go out on the patio and see where we crashed, and it was really it's kind of it's kind of eerie, you know, looking at it going, I almost died 600 feet out there in that water, you know, but. The reason I tell that story is because it changed things. I, I came back from that, and uh, in the hour and a half I have left tonight, uh, I just want to tell you, I mean, we, we may have to push Clancy back just a little bit, but that's uh, but you know, um, after that plane crash, I started looking at things differently. You know, there were things that will make you look at things differently. And I come back from the plane crash, and I remember calling up John Henry, this guy in Austin, old-timer, and I said, John Henry, I said, I am so self-centered that I can't even be in a conversation with anybody. I mean, I have to just force myself when I'm with somebody to go, Hey, Carl, how are the kids? You know, and act like I give a flip about the answer because I don't. 
All I care about is me. When we talk about manifestation of the self, we talk about it a lot. And, and one of the things we talk about as a manifestation, uh, Steve talked about it beautifully, that all through the rest of the work, now, well, we talk about manifestation of the self and how it shows up. And one of the things we talk about as a manifestation of self is story stealing. This is a little tool, little game I'll give you to play in Alcoholics Anonymous. Story stealing is where you come up and you start to tell me a story. But your story reminds me of one of my stories. And my story is much more interesting than your story. So I just come right over the top of your story and I tell my story and then I spin around and walk off. You know? And the other person, we call it story stealing. Rampant in Texas AA. Probably doesn't happen up here, you know, but I'm a, Watch for story stealing, you know, and, uh, you know, because, uh, and then there's other things we, we talk about a lot, but I start working with guys and I get with John, you know, this selfishness and self-centeredness thing, turns out it's mentioned in our literature, you know, and, and, but I missed it for a long time. I missed it for 17 years. If there's a mis- I'll tell you what happened in my first attempt through the steps. We went right from A, are you alcoholic and can manage, can't manage your own life. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if we were sought. And that's where somewhere along the line we started chanting like a bunch of kids at summer camp. I just want to take a second to say you don't have to do that. You know, The chanting is optional. It comes out of the treatment centers. The chanting at the end of the Lord's Prayer drives me out of my mind. I love the way you guys end the Lord's Prayer. It turns out, amen is a kick-ass way to end a prayer. You know? I mean, people have been doing it for a long time. You know, I mean, we're the only group of people that would take the Lord's Prayer and go, you know, I think I can do this a little cooler than Jesus did it. You know? Uh, you know put a little flavor on the end of it. And if you pucker it up when I said that word, I understand. You know, I mean, it's, I swear to God, you can get up here and talk about Buddha and Tupac, Oprah, and, and uh, you know, and saging, and American Indian spiritualism, and Hinduism, but you mentioned Jesus, and I go, what? What? Just saying. I'm not even a you know, big deal about it. But anyway, uh, it's... It's funny because Mark used to quote the carpenter a lot. You know, when, when Mark would be talking, Mark quoted a lot of philosophers. He quoted Eckhart Tolle. He quoted Buddha. He quoted the carpenter. And he would say, the carpenter says this. And I went up to him one time. I said, you know, it's funny, Mark. When you say the carpenter, I don't, I don't feel like attacking you. And uh, he goes, well, that's why I say it. Because it doesn't have as strong, it doesn't have those old ideas attached to it that that other word does. I don't know why. I've, I've never talked about that before. But about that time... Please don't hate me for that one. It just came out in my ear. I, you know, I don't know. But about that time, we're trying to work this deal on a new level, and I'm working with the guys, and and, uh, and it feels like I'm a step ahead of these guys sometimes. I'm 17 years sober, and there were times where they, they'd say, you know, will you sponsor me? And I'd go, well... Yeah, go home and read uh, the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. And I'd go home and read the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. I mean, there were times where I felt like I was just trying to stay a step ahead of these guys. And I, and I called up, and so, well, about that time, I started doing some work with Myers. Myers is my sponsor now, and, he, and Mark H., Mark Houston, was my deceased sponsor, and he he came into my life, he came into Katie's and our lives, and he he blew the doors off our sobriety. We were two people that were absolutely dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous of untreated alcoholism. I mean, we were sitting in these rooms. Katie had just lost her husband, and when she said we almost lost her, it was close. It came down to a little act of God that kept her in our fellowship. I was, I had no idea how much trouble I was in, because I wasn't having the struggles Katie was having, because she was doing stuff that was outside of her value system, and it was driving her crazy. Mark used to say most people arrange their behavior around their values. He said, we lower our standards to match our behavior. And what I had done was I had slammed my standards down to the floor. So what I was doing wasn't outside of my value system because I had lowered my value system down to the floor. It probably doesn't happen to anybody else up here in sobriety, but I'm telling you, I'm a guy that had significant problems well into AA, and I can't figure out what's going on. Well, Mark started, we go to a workshop with Mark, and it's so weird, you know, that... 
We, we went to this workshop 230 miles from Austin, and here's this guy, and I mean, when he talked, it felt like there was a silver cord between us. Everything he was saying was going right to my core. And I'm leaning over, and at one point, I lean over to Katie at one point, and I go, what book is this guy reading from? You know? <laughs> I have never heard half the stuff he is saying. I will never forget it. I mean, he was coming with stuff and he was talking about the strict spiritual disciplines of 10 and 11 and the disciplines of 10 and 11. And when I'm living within the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 and practicing the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, and I'm sitting out there going, la, 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 you know, because I'm not even in the same area code as the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. I'll never forget. He called this guy up. He was having a lot of fun with this guy named Sean. I mean, Brian. And he brings Brian up there at one point. He gets Brian up there. And Katie mentioned this a little bit. He says, uh, hey, Brian, he goes, let me ask you a question. He says, uh, do you meditate? We were at step 11 at this point. And he goes, do you meditate? And Brian goes, well, see, it's like this. He says, I'm a truck driver. See, and uh, sometimes I meditate when I'm driving the truck, you know, and that sort of thing. And uh, I'll never forget it. And Mark goes, okay, Brian, listen, two things, very important. First of all, when you're driving the truck, we very much need you to be about driving the truck, you know. We do not need you hurling down the road in a tractor trailer rig meditating. And he goes, second of all, in the future, when I ask you a yes or no question, I'm going to expect a yes or no response. So I'm going to ask you again if you meditate, and it's very important to me for you to say no. And, and, and Katie and I are sitting out in the audience going, Whoa! Am I glad he didn't call me up there? You know. <laughs> well, right after this, when I, was, I went off on a little bunny trail there, when I talk about the biggest mistake that we made in AA is we went right from see that God could and would if he were sought to doing the third step prayer. And I missed this whole body of work but on pages 60, 61, 62, and 63. It's not very important. It's just the root of my problem and the basis of my sobriety for the rest of my life. Other than that, just skip it, you know? You know, because it, it says on there, the first requirement, I'll never forget reading it. I was reading it one day, and it says, I see on there, it says, right after the C, the next little paragraph down, it says, the first requirement. There's a requirement in step three. It says, the first requirement is that I be convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Not only was I not convinced of that, that sentence had never touched me. The whole selfish and self-centeredness piece was not on my radar. Well, let me tell you, it is an absolute game changer in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about might differ from your belief systems. And I know for me, if you come at me with stuff that differs from what my sponsor told me or what my current belief systems are, my ego goes into self-defense. And now the ego is fighting for its life. So we work a lot with the set-aside prayer. God, please help me to set aside everything I think I know about uh, myself, the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and even you, God, so that I could have a new experience. Help me to see the truth. Something like that. Because I know for a guy like me, what I think I know stands in the way of the truth. Truth. Sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm reading the book and I'm going, oh yeah, yeah, I know this part. Oh yeah, this is that, this is that part where it says that. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, Jay Walker, you know, and and, uh, and then and then I'm going, oh, you can't tell me anything about this piece. I've already got it highlighted and underlined in my big book. You know, I do the set aside prayer and new stuff leaps off the page at me all the time. Well, the book takes a huge turn on page 60 and I missed it for 17 years. It, we call it the second surrender. The first surrender in Alcoholics Anonymous is the surrender to alcohol and other outside issues, and that's pretty easy because it comes on the heels of a fresh ass weapon. You know, there's there's something about a gorilla having his foot on your throat that makes it pretty easy to surrender. But trying to get one of us to quit playing God is a lot harder than getting one of us to quit drinking. Right? Because I was able to put down the drink and, you know, surrender to that. But this surrender to selfishness and self-centeredness took me hitting the wall a few times. It hit me when I was working with Bob. And what happened was I backed away from this thing. I licked my wounds a little bit. I waited the appropriate amount of time between that marriage and the next relationship. Fourteen days. And, uh, <laughs> and I run back into it again with self-will. And I hit the wall again. And I blow up another marriage at seven years. And I pull back. And then I go run at it again. You know, so, you know, when Katie talked about what usually happens, the show doesn't come off very well. But I don't know why. 
I think life's happening to me. This selfishness and self-centeredness piece, when you start really examining the manifestations of selfishness and self-centeredness, it is an absolute game changer. I mean, now all of a sudden, I mean, it can rewrite history. That fourth column we talk about in the fourth step, my favorite thing, and Katie talked about it, my favorite thing to hear when I'm doing the inventory with a guy is they write down, here's what they did, here's, here's, here's who I'm mad at, here's what they did, here's how it affected me, and I'll go, I'll do the fourth column with you. And we do this little sick man exercise uh, on the bottom of page 60. I missed it for a long time, and it talks about uh, seeing that these people are perhaps, it's, it's a compassion exercise, because I'm never, you know, when I'm, when, when I screw up, you're going to hear about my motives and my delusion and where I was coming from and why I wasn't trying to make this bad thing happen, that sort of thing. Now, now when you screw up, it's an outrage and I demand justice. But, you know, but when I screw up, you're going to hear my story. So that's why I'm blind to my own self-centeredness when I'm looking for it. And when Katie talked about being on a fact-finding and fact-facing mission, it's the job of the person hearing the inventory to be the one on the fact-finding mission. When I'm listening to the inventory now, it's like I'm a news reporter. I'm sitting there asking the guy, so where'd you come from and how many kids did you, were in your family and, and were your parents still together and how was the money situation? And where were you? And, and you formulate stuff that comes out that I've never said to anybody before. But but we take the, when we go in, the thing about it is with most of these resentments, I never considered for a second what was driving these people, what their motives were, what their background was. As Chris says, their lack of dealage. You know, what were they able to do? And, you know, is it possible that they were doing the best thing, the best they can? You know, and you talk about a game changer. You know, like Sandy says, we can go back and have a happy childhood. You know, I, I mean, it turns out they wasn't, some of that stuff wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. And, and one of the examples I like to use is, is by X, Y. You know, one time I'm, I'm going to do a workshop in, in Idaho, and they sent this guy to pick us up. And usually if I only have a little while to work with the guy, the, the, where we can get the most movement is in this selfishness and self-centeredness piece. If we can shift the focus to looking at selfishness and self-centeredness and manifestations of self and asking the power to help us get through that, it can be a real game changer for somebody sobriety that's just been hanging around the meetings and, and trying to get by the best they can. So this guy picks us up, and we're riding from Salt Lake City Airport, and his name is Sean. And I got a sponsee with me, and we're riding along, and he's telling me, and, and we and we go to lunch, and he says, you know, he says, oh, man, he says, my first wife, she was nuts. I mean, you know, whew, that, that was one ugly divorce, you know, and he goes, and, and I'm going to shorten the story a little bit, and he goes, and this chick I just broke, my second wife, oh, my God, I mean, she was an absolute, you know, maniac, I mean, riding on the hood of the car, and, you know, that sort of thing, and he goes, and, and this chick that I broke up with about three months ago, she was out of her mind, I mean, you know, and so I'm sitting there listening to this, and I go, Sean, um, we've just been talking about selfishness and self-centeredness. I said, how do you find yourself in relationship with all these crazy women? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, were they crazy when you started going out with them? Or is it possible that the only difference between the way they were when you started dating them and the way they were when you got a divorce from them was the effect of spending that amount of time with somebody as selfish and self-centered as you are? And his sponsor was sitting behind him, and his sponsor goes, Say that again. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we get outside, and my little sponsor was with me, he goes, Dang! I was like, What? He goes, Oh my God. He goes, We've been there like an hour, and you just, Boom! You know? And I said, That's my job, man. I'm the out of town guy. I come in, drop the bombs, go home. You know? I mean, you know, that's a, uh, but, uh, but it was that way with my first marriage. If you'd asked me what happened in my first marriage, I would have told you she cheated on me and I don't roll like that and that was the end of the deal. And you can get support for that story in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Looking back on it with the work I've done and selfishness and self-centeredness now, I would tell you that there's a very good chance that I exhibited a level of selfishness and self-centeredness in that relationship that would have driven anybody out the door and driven anybody crazy. I got the potential to do it in the marriage I'm in now. I've never been near as happy as I am with Katie. But my selfishness, I fall asleep. I fall asleep. If I don't stay in this work, if I don't stay connected to this power, I will fall asleep dreaming I'm awake. I will be going along and I get focused on my work and on my job and on the investments and on the sponsees and on the meeting and on the travel and on the stuff like that. And, and, uh, 
and next thing you know, Katie's not even getting talked to. And, and I don't know, I have a terrible habit. Part of my way of self-manifest for me is if, you, if, it, if she comes at me with a heavy conversation, it's like I'm on methadone. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, she started she wanting to talk about my youngest daughter, and I go, <laughs> you know, I, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's like I just go, mm, you know, and like, so... You know, one of the things we did, it's funny, I just, I just bought a chair that I put in our bedroom, and I call it the listening chair. There are times, because I'll try to lay down, and she'll start trying to talk to me, and I start going, and I go, hold on, I'm going to get in the listening chair. And, I, and, I go, and we've had some amazing talks in the listening chair. There were, uh, Mark came into our lives, and we, I've just got a few minutes left. Hang in there with me for about five more minutes. Mark came into our life, and we started working the program at a level that I had never experienced. He came into my table. I have a Thursday night meeting at my table with about 15 of my boys. It's the best day I've ever been involved in. He came in. I'll never forget the first meeting when he came in. He says, tell me about the amends process. We're going to start working with this new guy. You know, What do you figure when you get a new sponsor? You're going to write inventory, right? Mark sits down. He goes, where are you at with the amends process? And we started talking about, you know, unfinished amends. And he goes, I have, an ex- I have a, a feeling there's a significant experience available for you guys in the amends process. And we thought it was like Svengali or something. You know, we're like, how does he know that? Well, because nearly all of us have a significant experience available to us in the amends process. I don't know about you guys, but I made the big amends, and 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 the the list kind of went into the file. Next thing you know, we're making all of our amends, you know, and we're making a list, and we're having meetings, and we're getting together, and we got guys that have spiritual consent with each other. We have the right to call each other on stuff, even if you hurt my feelings. We like to say, "I'd rather step on your toes than stand on your grave." And I got people that are really willing to ask the hard questions and look. For the real answers, and you know, Bob talks about these unsigned death packs we have with each other, and we got guys that are willing to take the risk of. And we have meetings. We have meetings about sarcasm a lot of times. We have meetings about current agnosticism. I had some boys in from Colorado the other day, and the meeting was on current agnosticism. What is current agnosticism? Current agnosticism are areas of my life that I'm not bringing God into at this time. And we went around the room. I'll never forget it. This one guy had 23 years, and we're writing down, what are the three areas of your life you're not bringing God into? Current agnosticism. And this guy goes, holy mackerel. And we're like, what? He goes, the three areas of my life that I'm not involving God in are my marriage, my job, and my children. We're like, but other than that, uh, you know, that, you know, that's the way I fall asleep in sobriety. And if I'm not bringing these power, this power into this deal, the book talks about trying to establish a consciousness of this power. I don't think it's trying, you know, and I, I've barely touched the thing about in, insinuating the power, or, uh, uh, but, but. The book talks about a consciousness of this power. It's not trying to move me so much to a faith in this power or a belief in this power, but it talks about a consciousness of this power. On page 51 it says, When many hundreds of people are able to say that the consciousness of the presence of God is the most important of the fact of their lives today. It's not, you know, it's not that... God changed when I did the third step prayer at a new level. It's not like when I did the third step exercise that God picked his game up a little bit. I became more conscious of God's power. The book is constantly trying to move me to a consciousness of this power. You know, when I, when I talk about it, we were sitting there at the meeting one night on Thursday night, and I said, and they got guys that all have accountability with each other, and we do an email check-in with each other, and we're calling each other, and we're doing 10th steps with each other, and we're doing evening review, and we're doing morning meditation, and we're doing 10th steps throughout the day, and if you can't get me, you call one of the other guys on the crew, and we're, and one day we were sitting there talking, and I said, you know, we like to think of ourselves as being a little pocket of enthusiasm. Being a little group of even maybe big book thumpers, if you will. And look how hard it is to get us to work a basic, fundamental AA program. We're not talking about anything advanced here. How much better would our lives be if we were just practicing a basic, fundamental AA program out of the clear-cut directions in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? But the reason that we don't do it is because it's hard work. Consciousness is hard work. And staying in this stuff is a lot of work. And I am a sprinter. The problem, I like to go like hell for a minute. The problem is I'm a sprinter that's caught in a marathon. This is a long-term deal, and I like to go like crazy for a minute and then back off. All I can tell you 
is that my life has been on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous for the last 12 years, and I can hardly believe it. If you'd have come to me before that plane crash, if you'd have come to me when I had 17 years of sobriety and said, Charlie, the thing that's going to set you on fire and, and change your whole life and for you and the people around you is working the program out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have told you you're crazy. Because I've been in AA for 17 years. I know what this program offers me, and I hadn't stuck a toe in the water. If you're new here, we love you, and we're glad you're here, and we hope you'll come back and become a part of our lives. But the people I'm trying to talk to are middle management. I'm sick of losing people in middle management. We're losing the people with five years, 10 years, 15 years. And half the time it's between, behind pills. Half the time it's behind, but it's untreated alcoholism. And when I'm going along in untreated alcoholism and I don't even know it, next thing you know I go to the dentist, they give me some pain pills, I get a knee surgery, I get a back surgery, and the pills don't treat the knee, they treat the spiritual malady. And when they treat the malady, they trigger the allergy. And next thing you know you got a guy with 15, 25 years of sobriety going, what the hell? just happened. Two weeks ago I was sober and now I'm drinking vodka straight out of the bottle. If you're sitting around and you are not experiencing what you hear these people talking about from the podium up here, I'm telling you it's still available. It's available as a result of the work out of this big book. Get with somebody who's done that work. Go to that annoying little big book thumper in your room. You know, Just like I had to go to Myers and say I want to do the steps the way you guys do it. I don't know how to do it. I want you to show me how to write inventory. I want you to show me what we're talking about here. Your life will never be the same. I want to thank God for showing me to you people, and I want to thank you people for showing me back to God. I'm Charlie. I'm alcoholic. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.